I want first of all to acknowledge uh, people who did the work with me. Uh, it's Michelangelo Naim and Antonis Georgiou. They are my PhD students at the Weizmann Institute. Mikhail Katkov is research assistant and Sandra Romani uh, was my postdoc a long time ago, now in Janile. Actually, the, most of the team are now here except for Misha. So if you see some mistakes, it's their fault, not mine. <laughs> Uh, and uh <coughs> it's actually the first time I present this project to mathematicians. It's a, an ongoing project that we started working uh, will be s like close to 10 years, so things develop all the time. So I presented different parts of this uh, to different audiences, uh, but never to mathematicians, so I'm really looking forward to see what happens. Usually my experience is that physicists love this work, Psychologists hate it, and uh, neuroscientists are kind of neutral. So <laughs> we can uh, see where the math mathematics is on this uh, axis. OK, these are all the jokes I prepared at home. So there will be no, <laughs> no more jokes, I think, during this lecture. Uh, so uh, I will talk about human memory and how to model it mathematically. But uh, of course, uh, human memory is extremely complex uh, phenomenon. And uh, very unpredictable. So it's really the issue of whether you can even uh, <coughs> even make sense to to try to capture it mathematically is already non-trivial issue. So I just want to illustrate this unpredictability. So let's say uh, you want to remember my talk, and let's say sometime later you want to talk to tell somebody about my talk. So obviously many things have to happen for this. Uh, uh, for this process. So first you have to acquire what I'm saying, right? To internalize uh, my talk. So let's call this acquisition stage. I'm not really, I don't see my own slides here, which is a bit bothering me. Uh, and this uh, also, you know, it's a process that depends on many things. Obviously it depends on how interested you are in my talk. It depends on whether you're in a good mood, in a bad mood. Uh, on many things, whether you are also thinking about some other, like distracting uh, uh, things. Uh, but even if you manage to concentrate and uh, really understand everything I will tell you, uh, then, you know, if you want to, to, to tell somebody about this, uh, let's say, a week later or a month later, uh, then obviously you, you have to keep this information. So to maintain it, at least in some form. So there is a maintenance. Uh, phase, uh, and then uh, you have to actually recall what you remember. So even if you remember, even, even if everything goes well, you acquired my talk, understood exactly what I said, there was no traumatic experiences between now and then, so you still remember it, uh, you still have to recall it, right? And all of these stages uh, in our everyday life are very unpredictable and complex, right? So. And uh, basically, if you want to understand human memory, at least we have to understand all these three stages, right? But obviously, there is a lot more to memory than I just said. I'm already simplified very much. OK, so, uh, so let's just kind of cartoonishly summarize what I just said and say that there are three stages. You acquire information, then uh, this information that you manage to acquire, you have to maintain it in memory. So M here stands for both maintenance and memory. And, and out of the things that you manage to maintain, you have to recall some of them. Uh, and uh, so how would you study all these processes? And I'm saying that uh, in, in for real life uh, memories, uh, it's very difficult to study it quantitatively because the things which we normally remember are not just, uh, you know, yes, no things, right? It's not. Like I can ask you if you remember 10th digits of letter pi, and this is very easy to, to know, right? If, either you are correct or you don't, you're not correct. But remembering something like a talk or a story, it's a much more difficult uh, question because uh, you may remember some things, not remember other things. Usually what you remember is not directly what, I, what you read or what I say, but it's something that you infer from my talk. So it's uh, difficult to really quantify these things. 
so psychologists that study memory, memory psychologists, they developed some paradigms to study uh, memory in the lab. And the price they pay is that they replace this uh, real life uh, materials like stories and lectures, etc., to very artificial material. But the gain is that uh, the, the memory can be quantified very precisely. Okay? So I'll talk about one particular uh, type of this simplification, which is instead of uh, having some uh, meaningful information, we're just uh, talking about memory for meaningless information, like a list of words. So imagine I have uh, just collected uh, words uh, in an arbitrary way and put them together in a list. So now there is no information here, there is no story, etc. But still you can uh, remember this list. So I can do experiments with this and I can probe uh, all of these processes that we just discussed, right? Both ac all acquisition, how you uh, acquire information, how you maintain it, and how you recall. So for example, if I want to study, uh, let's say, memory, so uh, let's say I want to know after I present you a list, how many of the words you still have in, in your memory, I can do recognition experiments, right? So I will present uh, a list of words for you, and then I can just probe your memory on each word or some of the words in the list. I can show you a word, let's say creature, and I can either ask you, do you remember, was it in the list or not, or I can show you a creature with some other word that was not in the list, a distractor, and then I ask you, can you point to the word that is in the list? Okay, so by doing this uh, recognition experiments, I can calculate uh, some estimate of how many words you still remember after I presented the list for you. Yeah? In, in the lab, are they always nouns? Uh, actually, they're always nouns, yeah. I don't know why. That's how traditional <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, maybe it gets into storytelling. Yeah. Yeah, it prevents you from forming, yeah. But of course, some people can still make a story out of this, so. <laughs> well, it's not very precise, yeah. Yeah, please ask me questions if you have, you know, uh, during my lecture. Don't wait to the end. Okay, so that's how you can uh, study uh, uh, memory by just counting how many words you still, uh, you, how, many, how often you give a correct answers to these questions. And of course, I can, uh, uh, I can also study recall by asking you to recall. So instead of doing recognition, I can uh, again present you a list and then I can ask you just recall whatever you remember and in any order. I can, I can make the task more difficult. I can ask you to recall it in a particular order, uh, or I can just ask you to recall in, in any arbitrary order. And then uh, I, I will just count again how many words you can recall. OK, so these are uh, at least very uh, well quantifiable experiments at the price of being kind of meaningless information. Uh, and this is a very old uh, classical paradigm in psychology. The first experiments were back in 19th century. I mean, that's what we found, but maybe there are even older ones. Uh, so I will start actually from the end of this process. So I will tell you first about our study of recall because it's more advanced and we have more established results. And then I hope also to tell you about another project on, on uh, maintenance. Uh, so first, let me show you some very old and classical results. Uh, so the, the, the main puzzle, I would say, in studying recall is that it's, uh, it's a very challenging task even for this uh, simple kind of material and even for very short lists. So the uh, well-established fact is that you can recall uh, much fewer things than what you remember, right? And we know from real life that it always happens that we cannot recall things that we know. But here it's a very well-established fact that if I do memory experiments and recall experiments on the list of words invariably, it turns out that you can recall uh, fewer things than you remember. And this gap becomes bigger and bigger uh, if the lists become longer. So these are all very, very old experiments. Uh, were different experiments, so this is just a compilation that was done also a long time ago. All of these results are very old. So if you plot here the number of words in the list, L, and this is either M or R, 
and you see that uh, the memory is very good, so you can uh, uh, reach uh, a memory for more than a thousand of items, even after w one kind of quick exposure. Uh, but uh, recall is much worse, right? So let's say you cannot recall more than like 10, 20 words, even if the list become quite long. Okay, so the gap becomes bigger and bigger if the list becomes long. And also, there is some kind of uh, evidence for power law relations, right? That uh, everything here grows with the, with the length of the list, everything grows as some kind of power law. Yeah. Is it also true for false recollection versus false memories that you would have less false recollection compared to false memories? Uh, I don't know. Actually, we didn't uh, test, we didn't compare. Yeah. But that's something that can be easily done. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, so uh, first time when we started thinking about this, uh, like as I said, almost 10 years ago now, so we were very puzzled by this uh, power law kind of relations because there is no real explanation for this in the literature. Nobody comes, came up with any uh, possible uh, like reasons for these power laws. Uh, so I will tell you now about uh, uh, a, a model that we came up with, uh, which is really very, very simple. So I, I, it will take me just a couple of slides to present it to you, because I'm not giving you all this prehistory and motivation. I'll just give you the model as we now uh, work with. Uh, so there are uh, uh, two assumptions uh, in the model. So first is that uh, we assume that uh, every uh, item that you have in memory is encoded in the brain by a certain uh, neuronal pattern, so basically a collection of neurons, right? So you, the encoding of information in the brain is assigning a certain neurons to, to, this, uh, to this particular memory item, right? So imagine there is some big network that is uh, encoding different uh, memories of a certain type, let's say, and each particular memory is encoded by a random uh, sparse sample of this, right? And both of these uh, words are very important. So it's a sparse, meaning that it's only a small fraction of neurons that are encoding each memory. And this is random, right? So there was some process, presumably, of r randomization so that uh, you can neglect all the correlations. Okay, so you just have these binary vectors of zero ones. So for every neuron that you have in the network, you assign zero uh, if this neuron is encoding a particular memory mu, uh, or one, uh, z sorry, it's zero if it's not encoding and one if it is encoding. So you have uh, many, many neurons, presumably, in this network. Like, and you have some number of uh, items that you are encoding there. And uh, the sparseness uh, assumption uh, is uh, summarized here. So the, the, the average number of ones for each particular memory is a very small number. OK, so this is a, a, a one crucial uh, assumption uh, of our model. So this is, how, uh, th this is how information is encoded in the brain. And now I have to say something about what happens when you're trying to recall. So imagine that you have these representations. You kind of isolated them. You know mm -hmm. that these are the items that, are, that are, were included in the list. Now when you are recalling, uh, the, the main problem here is that there is no specific cue. So I'm not reminding you anything about the words that I want you to recall. I'm just saying recall whatever you can from the list. And so the assumption for the recall is that, uh, uh, that every uh, item that you recall is triggering the recall of the subsequent item. So I'm proposing a particular algorithm that uh, if you initialize it at one of the items, will produce a set of uh, 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 other items that you can recall. So how does this uh, proposed algorithm work? Uh, I'm saying, let's look at this uh, representation. So these are this, let's say, blue, blue circles, uh, these representations. And let's look uh, at the uh, overlaps between them, right? Because I assume that these representations are completely random, so obviously there will be some overlaps. So, so we can count how many neurons 
uh, uh, are in each of these overlaps. And let's say this is kind of a measure of how similar these representations are. Or if you talk about words, could reflect something about how similar the words are in their meaning, for example. Uh, so this is uh, so we compute this uh, matrix of these overlaps. So if you have m items, then it will be m by m matrix. And then the natural assumption is that uh, every time you have a transition from one word to another, you're just looking for a word which has the largest overlap, right? So in this case, let's say if you start from this larger circle, the next transition you will uh, go to this circle nearby. So if you continue this, uh, so what will happen in this uh, cartoon situation? So if you just apply this rule at the second step, uh, it will bring you back uh, to this thing. And so everything will stop immediately. You'll just go from one to another. Uh, so we uh, forbid this to happen. So we have uh, this kind of uh, a small footnote that says that the transition cannot go back to the same item from which you just came. Right? So it means that the next, at the next step, instead of going back, you will choose for other, other circles. So you'll find this one that has the largest overlap out of the ones that are still allowed. And then you will go here. Question. Yeah. These are what? Eta is a label for the memory that you have. So you have m memories in the network of n neurons. Oh, Either zero or one. No. What was the notion of similarity? You no, sorry. Sorry. Mu is one to m, just label of a memory. Yeah. Okay. The psi is zero one, which tells you whether a particular neuron is encoding this memory or not. But what was the similarity? You were saying similarity. Similarity is this uh, construction. So I just uh, look at two patterns, take two indices, mu and nu. So two memories, and I look at how close their representations are. Who representation in the brain? Yeah, in the brain. Yes could reflect something about how similar the meanings of the word is, but I don't need to, to assume anything about it. I'm just saying you have random representations, and you have this matrix of overlaps. Is it? I see, so Did I answer? So yeah. So each item could be mapped to? To this vector of zero ones, n-dimensional vector of zero ones. I see. So that's a pattern. That's a pattern, and this uh, dot product is this what I call similarity matrix. Mm -hmm. So the, the these patterns are random, so it means that the similarity matrix is also random because of that. Okay, so what you see here is that in this example, what will happen is that oh, sorry, I jumped too far. You will just circle around these three in this direction, right? So you'll go from here to here, then to here, and then back to here. And uh, you'll just continue uh, to visit these three items. And this uh, one item will be left out, right? So right. this. What was the algorithm again? Uh, so it's uh, just, I, I, I pick a first item by chance, yeah. just randomly. So let's say this one. Then I look at the overlaps and choose the, the largest one. So my transition will go from here to here, right? Because that's the largest overlap from the three that I have. And then I continue with this caveat that I cannot go back immediately. That's all. That's uh, actually my that's model. Not, I mean, break ties arbitrary. Say it again? Break ties arbitrary. What is arbitrary? Break ties arbitrary. <laughs> what's break tie? Ties. Ties. Equal. Ties. Equal. Hmm? Uh, if they are equal, right, you just flip a coin, yes. But in a large, uh, yeah, right, but in the large network, this will never happen. Yeah. Oh, I see that. Yeah. OK, so, uh, so, so what's special about this model? So basically, I think the, the most, uh, the biggest departure from uh, like how people usually think about these things is that this idea that we have a deterministic process, right? So this, uh, uh, it's really very different from how people uh, think about the brain and model it. So uh, that's maybe one of the few things that uh, neuroscientists really agree to each other, is that the brain is a stochastic thing. And this is based on many things, based on uh, observations. So if you record from neurons in the brain, they usually fire in a very erratic way and never repeat, the, uh, the, the pattern of activity never repeats. Uh, if you record EEG from the brain, of course, looks completely random. So it's a, 
uh, common assumption that the uh, brain is very stochastic. And as a result of this, also, uh, the theories of the brain are usually stochastic. So for example, if you take uh, like popular theories of decision making, they're all based on the reinforcement learning or diffusion processes. Every, everything is very stochastic. So here I'm saying, let's look at this model, which is completely deterministic. And as a result of this uh, deterministic model, you actually start circling in these uh, three items and never recall this one. Right? If you would imagine that this process is stochastic, then by just waiting enough, you would just uh, recall all the items that you have. Right? So it's a very important uh, assumption. Looks uh, quite paradoxical. And I will go back to this when, when I discuss some results with you. But I just want you to have this already in your memory, like a, a pre preview for, for maybe a discussion uh, more in the end. Uh, I'll remind you. <laughs> Uh, because the, it has an overlap which is smaller than the other ones. And so you, it never wins this competition right, for the largest overlap. Of course, if I would start recalling from this. Uh, but you could have broken three. I mean, you could have said you can't revisit three here being as well, but then just two. But initially, you didn't want to go back and forth. Yeah. You could say that you cannot go back at two. For long lists that are of real interest to me, it won't matter. Yeah. So the, the crucial thing is that you cannot go immediately. Right? Uh, OK. So what's uh, another way to visualize it? So I'm still not at the math stage, but just uh, drawing pictures. So you can, uh, so now you have this m by m matrix. So you can just uh, plot it like that. This is in color. So. And you have, I don't know if you see the, it's probably dying. And this is the graph, corresponding graph, with the nodes that correspond to items in memory. And so uh, the, the algorithm that I just described to you can be translated into putting this red and black dots. So let's say in every row, which is the overlap of item number one with all the other items, you choose the largest overlap, and you put, let's say, a black dot. But you also need to know the red, the, the second largest. So you put the red dot. So there are, I don't put it everywhere, but there are some red and, uh, red and uh, uh, black and red dots in every row. And the process goes like this. So you start from 1. You look for the largest overlap. So it will bring you to 14. So this is a black, the black transition. Then if you go to 14, you would want to go to 1, but you choose the next one, which will be uh, 10. So then there will be a red transition to 10. So you, s you, you go according to this rule. At some point, you will hit uh, the unit that already you already uh, visited. So it will be this kind of first loop. But then you can actually uh, continue sometimes. So sometimes you will turn to the same direction, and this will be your final uh, cycle. But sometimes. As I show here, you can actually go back, because this transition was uh, of red type. So now nothing prevents you from going back. So you go back for a few times, and you finally converge to another loop. So it's a quite complicated uh, structure. You have this uh, matrix. Uh, so you have this underlying randomness, which is the uh, patterns that I showed you in the last slide. Then there is this uh, symmetric matrix of similarity that has a very complex structure of correlations. Then you have this process that has a memory, because the next step depends on where was the, the uh, previous step. Uh, but eventually, it will always converge uh, to a loop. Question. What's the difference between red and black? So I, I'm just uh, saying that every time where you went according to the largest overlap, I put it in black. And uh, when I go to the second largest overlap, because I cannot go with the black, I put it in red. Just for you to to follow, is yeah. So I don't know if it does. Okay, so why? So w uh, after you first came to ten from fourteen, you cannot go back to fourteen, right? Right away. Right. So you have to continue. But after I come, you came back from ten from some other place. Now there is nothing that prevents you, so you can actually go. Why? Because now. Uh, why, why you couldn't go back from 10 to 14? Because you just came to 10 from 14. But 
But you are not to record it later when you <coughs> But now you don't remember this wh wh while when you do this uh, loop and came back to 10 from 16, now nothing prevents you from going to 14. <coughs> Why? Because this is not the, the place where you just came from. The rule, is the rule has a memory which okay. is just one step. Yeah. <laughs> If I have a very long memory, then eventually just go and visit all of the nodes. Right? <coughs> uh, maybe can I ask? Yes, sure. Uh, why is that the rule? <laughs> uh, I mean, on an okay. level, like, uh, if you were allowed to back I'll tell you how we came, came to this rule. So we were, like, uh, people usually study these things with neural network models where uh, this uh, you know, neural, you have these attractors, uh, these representations, patterns, and then there are certain rules of dynamics, so you don't really assign anything, like you don't tell in advance what will happen, you just have some dynamic rules. And then we just notice that that's what happened there. So in our particular implementation, we looked at this trajectory, somebody, I don't remember now even who noticed it, but somebody looked at the overlaps and said, bingo, it always goes to the largest overlap. Almost. Yeah, <coughs> but into, I think it's a clear intuition because, you know, obviously if you have a large overlap, it means that it's kind of a shortest distance for you to go. I, I guess if you were allowed to backtrack immediately, you could still have interesting dynamics. Right, but then you'll just go in uh, this loop, very short loop immediately. Uh, so you'll go just from one to uh, uh, with probability one half. And so this means that at most you will recall like two, three and nothing else. So this would be very different from our observations. Yeah. <coughs> sure. OK, so now <coughs> I, I really have the mathematical part of my lecture, finally, after I hope I rep uh, introduced you to the. Uh, so this is a, uh, now we have this basically one parametric um, family of models, which are specified by this parameter f, which is the sparseness of representation. And we would like to know uh, uh, wha how, what's the length of these trajectories. Of course, I mean, for different realization, oh, sorry, I'm not used to this thing. Uh, of course, we cannot really say how long this trajectory is, because it will depend on a particular realization of our matrix or of our patterns. But we want to know on the average, let's say, how on the average how long these trajectories are. Okay, I'm really jumping all the time. I don't know why. And and this is a, a, I don't really know how to solve it exactly, right? So we have no solution. But what we managed to do is we managed to get some uh, scaling uh, properties of the solution uh, when the when the matrix is big, right? So we managed to. Uh, oh no, why? I'm sorry, there's some problem with my. Ah, okay. Uh, so if we call this uh, recall capacity. Okay, now what? Uh, so this was actually the first calculation that we did on this model back in uh, 2013. Uh, so we were able to show that if, if the matrix becomes big enough, the average length of this trajectory, which we call the recall capacity, because that's really how many words you recall on average out of m that you remember, uh, scales as a power law of m with the uh, coefficient alpha depending on this uh, sparseness parameter that we have. Right? No, no, this is a kind of, uh, it's, uh, it's not math, really, because there is some hand waving there. But uh, <laughs> it's like more, you can say, more like physics. You know. uh, but uh, we con confirm this numerically. So it seems to work so this well. Means this diamond means expected value? No, it means that we did some thing, no, tricks. Uh, oh, the the bracket. The bracket. The bracket. Ah, yeah, the maybe, bracket. yeah. Right, yeah. But I mean, really, the derivation is also kind of. It's not exactly, I would say, kosher. But anyway, there is uh, probably. Uh, uh, it, it works well. So I think uh, even if there are some errors, they're, they're probably very minor. Uh, 
So that's what we did, and we were really happy about it because you see, uh, you, you yeah, invariably so get. On F, I yeah. So everything depends on f. So alpha we managed to know, calculate how it depends on f. K I don't really know. So numerically you can find how it depends on f. But the nice thing is that you have this power law which you don't pay anything for, right? So invariably comes out no, no matter what uh, sparseness parameter you take, you get uh, a power law. So we have this explanation kind of for why these power laws were observed experimentally. Also, you see, if you look at the, the coefficient of this power, it's always uh, smaller than one half. So we could understand kind of we have a very generic explanation for why uh, they recall, you recall many fewer words than what you remember, right? Because the, at most, this, uh, this converges to square root behavior, even if you have a very small f, right? But uh, for any other f, you have even uh, uh, worse behavior. OK, so uh, that's kind of lengthy thing, so I will not uh, give you uh, uh, the derivation. Uh, I have a very simple argument for why it goes to square root. So I will actually have a slide here. So now you can ask what happens in the limit. So why the limit of very sparse encoding is interesting? Because there is some evidence, really, uh, from, the, from biology, basically, that the encoding in memory is sparse. Right? So it makes sense to talk about sparse limit. So if you take a very sparse limit in uh, f goes to 0, so this becomes simple. So why it becomes simpler? Because you, you can th uh, it's a very simple calculation now to show that in this limit, you can think about this matrix as completely random symmetric matrix. All the correlations that were there due to this encoding, they kind of disappear when f goes to 0. So now it's a simpler problem. You have a random symmetric matrix. Again, you do the same algorithm. It's, it's still, we cannot really solve it uh, fully mathematically. We don't know like many things that you cannot calculate. But there is some miraculous thing that uh, the, the most important feature that we are interested in, which is the average length of this trajectory, you can calculate now precisely. right? So this is. <coughs> uh, this is the result of this calculation. Again, I would say it's much more math than the previous calculation. Still not uh, fully, 100%, but it's much more uh, solid. So I'm quite sure that this is a correct answer. And again, confirmed uh, numerically. So as, I, as you know, it converged to the square root behavior. But now we can even calculate the coefficient precisely. <coughs> so you asked me why square root. I have uh, one slide for this. I actually wanted to skip it. But uh, because you asked, I have to. <laughs> Give me so uh, how to understand the square root. So the square root you can understand if you go to even simpler model. If you say let's replace this matrix by a completely random asymmetric matrix. So then you can forget about this red and black because you never go back in the large matrix. So you have just a random map. From every unit there is a map that brings you to another one, and it's a very well known thing that the trajectories in this random, uh, completely random graphs have a square root, and uh, they uh, know the, the coefficient. So this is basically the calculation. I think I can skip the calculation because it's really very simple. But the result is that the, in this completely random graph, the average length of this trajectory is the square root of pi over 2 times m. right? And uh, we have a, a much more complicated graph. But again, as I said, there is some miracle here that uh, even though the graph is now more complicated, you have this. Uh, uh, memory dependent transitions. But the whole effect of all this <coughs> complexity that is that we have this extra 3 here in the equation. That related to like the longest increasing subsequence in the permutation? No. It's related to what's called birthday paradox. I don't know ah, if we have those. It's much, much simpler. Yes. OK, so we have this uh, <coughs> uh, extra 3. And this bec exactly because when you first hit the, uh, the item that you already visited, sometimes you stop here. Yeah. But sometimes you can go back. And the probability to go back is actually 2 over th 3. You can estimate it in this limit. And that's why you have this extra 3. 
Okay, so that's why I said it's a miraculous thing because the process itself is very complicated and there's nothing really you can calculate, but the one thing that you really want to calculate, you, you can calculate very precisely. <coughs> Uh, I would say 1% give it a take, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now uh, I finished the mathematical part of this project. Uh, and uh, now I'll tell you something which is really the most surprising thing about this project, which is the psychological uh, part, which is that uh, can we really test these kind of models, right? And the... Uh, Uh, okay, I have to speed up, but I just want to tell you that the, 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 the whole idea that you have this simple equation looks very uh, weird for, for this field because, as I said, I mean, it looks like I can really predict the results of some experiments, even though everybody knows that, you know, some people have better memories, some people have worse memories, you know, if with age we discussed over lunch, I mean, if you ask me or some like students, it will be completely different performance. Also, it's, it really depends on how I do the experiment. I can present the words like very fast or I can give you more time. All of this is known to affect the performance. So how can I claim that this uh, uh, still makes sense? And uh, this kind of develops. So at the beginning, we really didn't think that it makes this like, per, like quantitative sense. Uh, my only escape from this is to say that this M here is uh, something that carries all this unpredictability, right? So I'm saying if you have somebody that has a good memory, he will remember more words than somebody has a w bad memory. If I give you a very quick presentation, you'll remember few, fewer words than, what, than if I give you a longer time, right? So that's the only escape that I can have is to say, this thing is unpredictable, but after I know how many memories you remember, how many words you remember, then it doesn't really matter how it happened. I can predict on the average how many you will recall. Okay? So how do I test uh, these things? I have to do both of these experiments that I showed you at the beginning on the same people under identical conditions. right? And I use one experiment to estimate M and another experiment to estimate R. Right? So I do uh, recall experiments and recognition experiments uh, on the same people under the same condition. And for some reason, this was never really done in the field. So we are the, the first one, as far as we know, that actually do this, right? The people did uh, these experiments uh, isolate in, in isolation, but never did this uh, in a way. And we really made a lot of effort to do it under identical conditions, because the whole point here is that uh, you, 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 w you want to put all the potential variability in M, but you want to measure the recall for the same exact conditions. And we do it on the internet because we, we have no lab, so we do it uh, now with Meta Mechanical Turk. It's a very nice uh, a platform that allows us to do a lot of subjects and, um, and uh, very cheaply to collect data. So let me just show you the results. Uh, so this is the, from the recognition experiments, we do a list of different lengths uh, uh, from uh, 8 to more than 500, and we measure M with recognition experiments. We did two conditions to really confirm that conditions of the experiment are really important. So this M is not, in, not a universal, uh, sorry, I jumped. Uh, so this is not a universal thing, you cannot currently predict it. Uh, but you can measure it, and now you do recall on the same people of different lists. We average uh, this. I don't give you any of the experimental details, which are extremely important here. I'll just show you the result. Uh, so under these two conditions, we have uh, 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 eight possible uh, values for the M and two speeds. So we have 16, uh, 8 or 7. 16, 32, 1, 128. Yes, seven, uh, seven uh, conditions, uh, two speeds. So we have 14 points in these experiments, and they're all very close, like very close to our predicted curve. Okay, so that was the, that's the main result. Very surprising for us, and I think uh, it confirms all of these assumptions that uh, 
whatever variability there may be in uh, between people, between conditions, is, it's all in the way you actually remember things, but not in the way you recall. So apparently there is a very universal kind of uh, algorithm that goes into your brain when, you st uh, when you're recalling things, and it works apparently in the same way for all the people, right? No matter how good or bad they are. But the error bars <coughs> are pretty wide, right? Error bars are pretty wide, yeah. Because... Uh, that We can predict the error bars. Yeah. If we simulate our model many times with different realizations, we predict the error bars e extremely well. Oh, so these are also Yeah, yeah. <laughs> our uh, calculation referred to the average behavior, but, but by doing the simulations, we can also estimate the okay. error bar. This is f equals zero. That's all f equals zero. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that, uh, yeah, but this F1% is uh, estimated from some recordings. I don't really know what this matrix is, right? So, I'm, you know, I, this was all motivation. This is just a uh, result, right? So results seem to fall on the line, which corresponds to F equals zero. Yeah. Why it is, and yeah, random and random, mat random symmetric matrix with this particular rule that I came up with, yeah, I proposed. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> so we did uh, w w just one more uh, result I showed because we said, okay, the, the, the model didn't really say anything specific about what, what is it that you try to remember. So we, the experiments are usually done with words, uh, but the model is completely general. So uh, people started asking us, but w what happens if you rec recall something else? So we came up with another paradigm where instead of words, you have uh, very short sentences that express well-known facts like uh, Italians eat pizza or, or Earth is round, things like that. So we came up with, a, we just uh, wrote down a lot of these lists in a big, uh, big table. This is just a subsample of this table. And we did exactly the same experiments with some uh, modifications because now we are talking about sentences, not words. So you can rephrase the word, but uh, if you do uh, all this, uh, take care of all this uh, uh, extra issues, we have exactly the same behavior. So now uh, this is a, we, we can only go up to here, but this blue uh, curve is for the, these short facts and it also follows the same line. So it looks like no matter what you do, you cannot really escape this predicted black line. Okay, let me give you a little bit uh, like future things. So what, what do we want? So as I said, the model is very complicated. So we just calculated one thing, which is the average trajectory. But there are other things which are potentially very interesting. So for example, I told you that you always converge to a, to a, to a cycle. So how many cycles there are? So when you simulate, uh, it's usually the one cycle or two in the list which are not too long. So if you have these two cycles, then it means that sometimes you will fall into one, sometimes you will fall into the other one, depending on where you begin your recall, right? So in theory, this could, in principle, this could also be observed, right? If we have s multiple recalls <coughs> of the same list, but uh, has to be taken carefully, we will be expecting to see that all of our uh, recall trials will fall into two, two different uh, categories. So we are uh, thinking about how to do it correctly. Another idea was proposed to us uh, by somebody said, OK, wh what if you, when you finish your recall, you give a reminder? Can you really force people to go to another cycle after they already get stuck into another one? And it, this didn't work, right? And I think there is a deep, deep, uh, deep reason why it didn't work. So w if you just think about it as if you could just simply reset your thing, you, you know, you, you recalled some number of words, let's just start again. So obviously then you would recall more words, but we know that we cannot do it. So the question is, can you help people to do it? And it turns out that even reminding them of another word doesn't help. So we, uh, theoretically, we would predict that sometimes you would recall, after this reminder, you would recall there is a tail of this distribution. So you would recall many more words, but it didn't work. People don't never recall many words. They, at best, they recall a couple of more words, but most of the time they actually cannot recall anything at all. And this, I think, really tells you that the process is much more forced and deterministic than what we really think. That after you enter a loop, there is not a simple way for you to just forget what you did and, and start. Okay, let me uh, uh, 
Um, actually, I, I don't know. We have to finish at three, I guess, right? No. So. <laughs> but now the institute is closed, so we can go <laughs> for a while. <laughs> uh, so no we don't follow rules. We don't follow rules. He's Russian. You take a chance. He might yeah. have to six. Uh, and by the way, if you look at these distributions, so this is the distribution that we predict. This is to, somebody asked me about the error bars, right? So this is the distribution of uh, how many words you recall b b before you get stuck. This is computed from uh, simulations of our model, and this is the experimental histogram. And if you rescale it, you'll see it's practically identical, right? So not only uh, the model predicts well the average uh, uh, performance, but it really tells you very well about the spread, right? And the spreads are very big here. But the reminder looks okay here. Reminder doesn't work okay, because the reminder was supposed to give you sometimes a lot of extra words to remember, and we never see this, right? So we actually, because we were a little bit distressed by this result, we, we thought, like, what happens if you give a reminder not at the end, but in the middle, right? And it turns out that the reminder is actually disrupting your recall. <laughs> so we have this amazing result, and I'm really a little bit suspicious even about it, but just a few days ago. So you see how many words you recall after a reminder, which you put like randomly at different positions. And you, it really pr prevents you from recalling words that otherwise you would have prevented, right? So something about this is very kind of precise and uh, uh, cannot be really uh, deal, dealt with, like cannot be interfered with, right? Anyway, I think it's a really a d deep question, but for now uh, 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 I don't have anything else to say. So let me remind you of this basic equation that we derived for the recall. And let me go now to, I want to still tell you about uh, another project that we do about uh, maintenance. It's uh, not as advanced as this one, so it's, we are only working on it uh, for less than a year, and everything is a little bit preliminary. But uh, uh, let's be more ambitious. So l let's say, OK, so I told you that this M cannot be predicted, right? It's very variable, depends on many things. But let's, uh, let's assume, and that may be even more outrageous, is that actually most of variability is actually in A, right? That how you acquire information. And after you acquired information, there is some something predictable about what you will remember sometime later, right? Can we entertain this idea and come up with some suggestions about how, how we can actually compute this M, potentially, if we know? So let's say I give you a set of words, and I'm saying now I'm basically some of the words you may just completely miss, right? It's not that you will remember them and then forget, but you just don't miss them. You were distracted by something. You blinked or whatever happened. Uh, so obviously, some of the words will be lost. But after, if I know, if I establish how many words you actually internalized, uh, maybe, I can, uh, maybe I can compute or at least estimate uh, how many words you will remember by the end of the representation. So how would this be? So again, we have this. Uh, uh, and, and OK, th there are some uh, results in the literature which are not as uh, well established in the recall about also power laws. So everything in this field is power laws. But people claim that as time goes by, the chance that you remember things decays as power law of time. So there are this uh, kind of uh, results in the literature. <coughs> uh, so now <coughs> I have another game. So th this. Uh, uh, model that I described to you is really looks like a game. So le let's come up with another game. Uh, and here it's even less. I cannot even give you this rationale in the like prior work on neural networks. I just had an idea like that. Uh, and the idea is like that. So you are acquiring information, and some of this you obviously forget, right? You don't remember everything that you acquired. So the question is, uh, uh, what determines which things you will still remember and which still not? So psychologists uh, debate this issue. And there are basically two main possibilities. One is just passage of time leads to forgetting. That's one idea, number one. And another idea is that passage of time does not lead to any forgetting by itself. 
Instead, what happens is that you have uh, interference. So when you learn new stuff, uh, new stuff can erase the old stuff. And there are other ideas, which is uh, consolidation. So if you don't forget something for a long time, it becomes so stable that you never forget. So let's forget about uh, consolidation. And let's uh, entertain the, the possibility that uh, actually the, this uh, interference is the main reason for forgetting. Right? So you forget things if you remember something else, which for some reason the brain decides is more important to keep than, uh, than what you remembered first. So the simplest, uh, the most, most simple implementation of this idea is to assume that everything that you, let's say you acquire new memory every time you see something or hear something, you acquire new memory. And memory is actually characterized by some kind of value. And then every time you acquire new memory, you see if the new memory is stronger or more valuable than the previous memories. And everything that is less valuable, you erase. OK? That's a very primitive idea. So that's just a. Uh, if you illustrate this with a bar, so the height of the bar is a, OK, sorry. Uh, OK, let me stay here. So you have a, a memory, and then you have another one, another one. So they are all less valuable, so they all stay. Now you come with a new memory. Every time you check whatever you already have, and let's say this happens every second, so you have a new memory. You see if there is something that is less uh, valuable. So these three guys, uh, OK, finally died. So these three guys have to go away. And so at the end, you will just have to left. OK, now this process just keeps going and going. As you see, there are a lot of uh, interferences, a lot of erasals. So most of the things that you put in uh, eventually disappear. And it's very easy to calculate that the probability that if you put something in this game and after t steps it's still available will be 1 over t, right? Because it has to be the strongest uh, of all the other ones. So I really, uh, we, we talked a lot with Andre, and he taught us uh, some uh, uh, how to derive all these things you know, without writing any equations. So uh, I, I want to, to acknowledge his uh, help in, in this project. Uh, so this is uh, so you see again you give this you get the power law for free no no effort but there is a problem with this model because if you if I ask you then if the after a very long time how many things you still remember this results in a logarithmic uh, behavior and obviously that's not good because even this would mean that all of you here even the youngest who uh, remember around twenty things right so that cannot be true you would not be here if you were. So how would you improve this model? Uh, so the, uh, the one idea to improve it is to say that uh, you don't have just one uh, value, because uh, different things may be important for different reasons. So let's assume that there, is, there are some number of dimensions along which things can be important. So let's say some things are important for you because your career depends on them, your survival depends on them, social things, and, and things like that. So every thing that you hear or acquire is characterized by several numbers now. And the rule for erasal is that uh, you only erase a previous memory if it's uh, smaller than the new one in all dimensions. Right? So in this uh, example, you have four memories. You come up with another one. This two will go. And you'll be left with three. And these three are not erasing each other, because at least in one dimension, one is bigger than another. Right, so uh, I don't know how to calculate the average um, uh, behavior of this model. So I cannot calculate exactly the probability that the memory stays for some time. But there is a, uh, I can do it iteratively. So I did it for one dimensional model, and then I can just go from one dimension to another. And again, I thank Andre because we had some cumbersome calculation for this, and he showed us how to do it uh, in a very elegant um, combinatorial way. OK, so you can actually, for some uh, small number of dimensions, you can just calculate these things one by one. And for a very large t limit, which I think is the only interesting limit, you can uh, get to some asymptotic equations. So, so you see that the probability to retain a memory for time t is uh, also given by 1 over t, but with logarithmic uh, corrections. And so this behaves in a more reasonable way. So if you now plot. 
uh, how many memories uh, accumulate. So you see, after a very long time, you can accumulate some few tens of thousands of memories if you go to some uh, reasonable dimensions. OK, so this is a, a suggestion. And I agree, it's completely arbitrary suggestion, very kind of uh, uh, just ad hoc. But it uh, leads to some interesting mathematics. And, uh, but before telling you about some of the uh, mathematical issues that you can uh, think about in this model, uh, let me show you one experimental uh, result that we did ourselves, again, using this random list of words. So it's practically this recognition experiments with some few number of twists that were uh, needed in order to control better for the acquisition. Again, people normally don't distinguish these things, but we wanted really to control this. So we present uh, people with this long list. And then basically, we want to do recognition. But instead of just waiting to the end, we do recognitions along the way at random times. And we have three types of recognition tests. So we can either ask you about the word that was uh, one before the last. And this would control whether you are really paying attention. <laughs> uh, we can ask you for a word that was 10 words back. This would control for our idea that its interference goes from backwards in time. Or we can, at random times over this presentation, we can ask about this uh, word that were in the beginning. And this would measure us a retention curve, what I call retention curve, the probability uh, that this word survives for a different amount of time. <laughs> so we, uh, just to uh, cut it a bit short, so we have uh, these three curves. So this is the two-back task. You see some people get tired towards the end, so they don't really stop paying attention. So that's why this declines. This 10-back also declines for whatever reason. And this is our uh, uh, main curve that we want to, uh, to understand. This is the probability that you still remember a word after a long and longer time of intervening stimuli. So you see it declines. And eventually, what's plotted here is the probability to answer correctly to this question. So when this will decline to 0.5, it means that you completely forgot uh, what you were there. So in order to account for this variability, in, so you see some people stop paying attention. So we use this task to back task to select people, those that uh, do the, the job perfectly. Uh, and then we have this result. So everything kind of falls surprisingly into place. So this is by selection. We have a, a perfect performance. This uh, behavior of the 10 back task was flat now. So it didn't decline because these people keep uh, working. And the green line. Uh, we can now look how it compares to our uh, models, right? So we have this uh, uh, number of dimensions. So we, if you plot 4, 5, and 6, so you see, surprisingly, it falls right at n equal 5, and 4 and 6 can be very well separated from this. So it, it's, it looks not bad. Again, it's a very complicated model mathematically, but uh, for this uh, average retention curve, which is of most uh, of the interest, we, we can do these calculations based on this iterative equation that I showed you, and it looks not so bad. So, Sorry, so when yeah. you take away that uh, we are focusing on four or five attributes? That uh, this data is pretty well uh, falling onto the line for n equal 5, oh. and it's sufficiently far from 4 and 6 that you can actually tell that it's 5 and also not 4 it's and 6. Yeah, it's really 5, right? I mean, there is a lot of noise here. So we are paying attention to five attributes. That, uh, right, according to this, you are paying attention to five. Or the, there are some representations of five attributes in the brain. Uh, OK, so let me show you a little bit again some uh, interesting issue that can arise from here. So that's what we learned really from Andre. Uh, so you can think, you can cast this as a partially ordered set. Right? I, I didn't know anything about partially ordered set before I came to the institute. So that's a really uh, a nice thing that I learned here. So why is a partially ordered set? Because we have these memories that uh, have a certain number of dimensions. And some of them are erasing some other ones, and some are not. Right. So let's say this guy is bigger than that. Let's say call this bigger than that, is bigger than that. But, but these two are incomparable. Right? So that's a partial ordered set. <laughs> Uh, and there are a lot of cool theorems about this uh, that I also learned. 
like deal with theory, a, lo a lot of the things about chains, anti-chains that I learned. So we didn't yet find the way to direct, like the idea would be to do psychology experiments to test the mathematical theorems. That's where we are uh, aiming at. So these uh, cool theorems, we didn't yet find the way to directly apply to the experiment. But there is one very simple theorem that seems like very easy to, to, to at least uh, at approach experimentally. So there is a, uh, you can ask whether you can now take this uh, set of uh, memories and rearrange them such that uh, nobody will erase nobody, right? So in this cartoon, it's very easy to come up with this rearrangement, right? You just, I had to put this in front of this two. And now I would say that if you present the same uh, five memories in this order, you would remember all five, right? But in this order, original order, you will only remember three. And there is a very uh, nice, th very simple theorem that says that that's actually universally true. For any finite set, you can, uh, it's called linear extension of the partial order. You can rearrange things so that uh, 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 you, you will never forget anything, right? It's a very strong kind of uh, uh, prediction that <laughs> you can uh, find a, a good order for any set of memories that you have, you find a good order. So for very simple theorem for finite sets and even true for infinite sets, but we, Luckily, our brains um, are finite, so we don't need to understand these uh, theorems for infinite sets. So the issue is, so how do you find this order? Now, of course, if I would know these uh, values, then I would just uh, do some, it would be easier. But we cannot, right? We all, all we know is that we can uh, run this experiment and we can do some recognition tests. So it turns out that, at least in theory, it's, it's very easy to find the correct order. All you have to do is you do several steps of this uh, iteration. So you run this, uh, the, the set, the, okay, the sequence of, of uh, let's say, words or memories. You, you determine, if you could just determine which one you remember and which one not, so you can then take the one that you remember and put them in front, right? So in this example, just one iteration already results in a good order, right? If the lists are longer and if there are more dimensions, then it sometimes takes you more. But we found that uh, numerically, that even for very, very long lists, it's just few iterations, t few iterations usually enough to find this order. So this would be uh, one of the po possible ways to really address it in a much more non-trivial way. So th this is a very intricate, things that depend really on this basic assumption about how the models work. And we, we are planning now to do these experiments. And there are l lots of experimental issues to do it. But in, but in principle, these are doable experiments that will uh, hopefully will reason. Yeah. So what's the ratio of the number of items between? I said to you is right. Then the, the whole of variability is actually in this first stage. So the, the take-home the take message should be that you should just concentrate better when you learn things and then everything else is more or less doesn't depend on you. So if you just learn not to think of uh, concentrate well, that's my take home message, then you will be fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>